Good evening, everyone. Coming to you from Santa Fe, New Mexico, I'm Scott Harrison, Artistic Director of Iron Week Productions, and I want to welcome you to Talking Theater Santa Fe, a series of conversations between me and Santa Fe theater artists, sharing stories about their experiences in the theater and the unique paths that led them to creating theater in Santa Fe. I'm very thrilled to have as my guest this evening, Santa Fe actor, director, producer and founder and artistic director of Theater Grotesco, John Flax. John, it's an honor. Thank you for being oh, it's here. A pleasure. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, great to be here. Um, a little bit more about John before we start. John is co-founder of Theater Grotesco. He's also worked with, and I'm gonna, I, there are several French, French pronunciations in this bio <laughs> and I'm sure I'm gonna mess them up, but I'll do my best. Um, he has also worked with Theater de la Jeune Lune in Minneapolis and Paris, the Paris Circus, London's Theater Complicité, the Los Angeles Philharmonic San, uh, with San Francisco choreographer Della Davidson, the Sundance Playwriting Laboratory, the Out of Context Orchestra, and the Sev de Balkan Choir. He has taught at theaters and colleges nationally and internationally, along with eight years as a National Endowment of the Arts, Arts and Artists in Schools. He was a board member of the National Network of Ensemble Theaters and is a graduate of the Ecole Jacques Lecoq in Paris, where he also studied with Philippe Gaulier. He studied voice with Arthur Lessac, holds a BA in Environmental Studies from Prescott University or Prescott College and uh, has an EDD in anthropology and, phil and philosophy. At the age of 12, John was a state judo champion. In his early 20s, he led a 2000 mile kayaking exposition, uh, expedition across Canada. John has just returned from New York where he is working on Godfrey uh, Reggio's new film. I think I got through them all. <laughs> <laughs> you did well. Uh, just so your, your audience knows, I, I don't actually have an EDD. I, I have all but dissertation for an EDD. That, gotcha. <laughs> Important yeah. distinction. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, so when I do these uh, interviews, sometimes I'm interviewing people that I uh, have seen, but only just recently met. And sometimes I interview people that I've that I've known for a long time, and both experiences are, are treasures to me. Um, but I've really been looking forward to this uh, conversation, John. Just thinking back on um, on our shared history over the years, and I was I was thinking about that the other day. And you, well, I actually knew of you um, uh, probably a couple years before we actually met um, in two thousand one. I, um, my wife and I were living in New York and we were looking at wanting to move somewhere to another place that we kind of both resonated with and theater wise, I was interested in moving somewhere where I might be able to maybe start a theater company or produce some of my own work. And I was flipped, I got a uh, American theater magazine. I was flipping through it. And, you know, sometimes I wouldn't even re you know, read the magazine depending on the month, but I came across, I saw this photo on the top of an article of uh, Zazobra, um, you know, this 150 foot burning effigy. And I was like, I have, what is this story about? <laughs> and it was a story about, um, about Santa Fe theater. And you were part of the story, Grotesco, obviously. I think Elizabeth Wiseman was interviewed. I think even Danielle may have been interviewed as part of it. Um, David Olson, Rachel Kelly, many people from the theater uh, in, in Santa Fe. And, um, I was really intrigued and I remember telling Lisa, I was like, well, maybe we should, uh, we should put Santa Fe on our list. And, and we did. And 20 years later, here we are. So well, I'm you, glad you did. We can do you remember America. that article? Do you remember that? What? Uh... You know, I do. Yeah. And, and actually the woman who came out to write that article uh, now runs um, what was called the Rockefeller Map Fund grant. Um, is that the one? Yeah, out of New York. And uh, she came and, you know, she spent a good deal of time and interviewed a lot of people. It was it was great of her to do and great yeah. at TPG to, you know, give us the ink. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a, it was a really cool article. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we when we yeah, we moved here and, and moved to Velarde in um, the fall of 2002. And then, yeah, I was just thinking of how our we first met each other, which was I saw uh, keyholes 
and which was just magical. And um, I remember, you know, again, at that time, I was thinking, man, I'd love to, at some point, just look at, at producing my own projects. And, and I was, I was put in touch with you, I think I probably sent you an email. Mm -hmm. And you very kindly met with me, I said, I'd love to just kind of talk to you about theater in Santa Fe and, you know, possibilities here. And you very kindly agreed to meet with me. We met at, uh, at second, the old original Second Street Brewery. And uh, <laughs> anyway, that was, uh, and you were just very kind about, um, just about your experience and very encouraging. And it was the, it was the start of a, um, a mentorship and a collaboration and a dear friendship. And I'm just really grateful. Well, for that. You, you've got a great memory. Um, I, I, you know, I, I vaguely remember that, but not the, in the detail that you do. But uh, yeah, it was, it was great of you to reach out. And, um, you know, it was special to welcome, uh, you know, uh, theater artists and uh, someone wanting to start a company. That's, that's really special. Well, it's interesting because you're, I mean, your encouragement of me and the way you were with me, I mean, I've had the opportunity to do similar things since moving here with other people. And it's just, I've always remembered back to that. Yeah, when you just said, oh, sure, I'd love to, love to get, I think you even had a, you had like an airplane you were catching later in the evening or something, but it was just super, super generous of you to, to, to sit down with me. Um, and also I just, you know, one of the things too, uh, I've just been thinking about during, COVID is how uh, just feeling a lot of gratitude for different things. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I just wanted to say how grateful I am at just at the top of this for you all gave us our first uh, donated your rehearsal space to us for our first project, mm -hmm. which was Fool for Love back in 2004. And Anna Geiger to Reinhardt with Warehouse 21 donated a, a space, you know, to perform. Um, but yeah, so we, uh, we got to rehearse in the Amber space, which, uh, you all had used for quite a while, which was just a huge, yeah. just helped us getting started. Um, how wow, long had you I mean, all been in that space? Um, oh, that's a good question. See, I, I don't even remember you using it. So I'm going to have a hard time remembering when we got there, but, uh, you know, basically, except for a few years, um, we've always used donated space here. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's kind of a, you're weighing things and we would much rather uh, pay the actors than uh, right. rent space. So we've been lucky, uh, but we've sought it out as well. Um, you know, when there's, uh, Amber's was basically, a, you know, it's just a big empty building. The heat often didn't work. Uh, the floor was rough. We laid a, a bunch of carpet down so that we wouldn't ruin our knees and stuff, but, um, it allowed us to pay actors a little bit and we had space we could use. That's cool. That's yeah, cool. I, and boy, I can't remember when we first got there. Yeah. Uh, I know we rehearsed keyholes in there because I remember setting up the, um, the tightrope. We had the tightrope between two poles and we were all trying to learn how to walk it. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. Now had you, and the tightroping, had you done that before? Like with at Lecoq, had you done that type of, no. So you've never done that at all, yeah. No. And yeah. in fact, I, I was the worst at it. Um, you know, some of the guys got pretty good, but I never did. <laughs> it wasn't well, I, I remember that. I just, yeah, that, that production was, was magical. Um, I, uh, I'm always curious, and I don't think we've, I've ever asked you this before, but I'm just really always curious about the beginnings of people's interests just in, just in make-believe or just in storytelling. And I wondered if you can remember your, your earliest memory of just being intrigued by make-believe or play acting or storytelling mm. or your imagination as a kid. Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. Let's see, you know, <laughs> again, you're asking me to go back even further. <laughs> I'm an old man. Uh, <laughs> That's right. uh, you know, I, I grew up rural and um, let's see, you know, uh, I, I played a lot by myself and it was outdoors. So, uh, I mean, I remember uh, this is more, this would have led me to engineering more than the theater, but uh, we lived on a long dirt driveway that had a hill to it. And when this was in Minnesota, so uh, in April, when the snow started melting, 
uh, that dirt driveway was one big mud heap. And I would spend days uh, kind of channeling the water through different puddles and different grades. And, and um, <laughs> you know, I guess I should have been building bridges and stuff. But um, so, you know, my play wasn't so much um, theater uh, bound, uh, yeah. but I had a godmother who um, was an interior decorator in Chicago and, and quite flamboyant and fun. And, and most of her friends were actors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from a really early age, when I'd go visit uh, her and my grandparents in Chicago, um, I'd get there on the train and that night I'd be in the front row of some play somewhere, uh, you know, with my eyes wide watching theater happen. Oh. Um, you know, it wasn't something that I said, oh, I want to do that. Not not back then, but I was certainly exposed to it at a really early age. Yeah, yeah. You know. So your first kind of experience with theater was more like kind of published plays, kind of that type of... Uh... Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then actually my, my godmother would come uh, and visit every Christmas. And she would have been coming from uh, whatever their association of decorators was, their Christmas party, which, from what I gather, was a, a you know drunken bash where where they uh, made fun of all their uh, wealthy clients and all their idiosyncrasies. And she kind of um, was the master of ceremonies, and she'd write all these satirical songs based on Christmas carols. And then she'd come to Minnesota, and she'd lay the whole show on my brothers and, and sister and I, and we'd redo the show for my parents. So uh, <laughs> oh, man. We, we were doing her plays uh, early on. So did was this something that you're uh that your brothers and sisters kind of enjoyed too? Or was this, you know, I mean, the kind of putting on these plays or? Yeah, we all got a kick out of it. Um, yeah, but I, and none of us said, oh, wow, this is something I'm gonna do with my life. Um, when did, so yeah, for you, like, <laughs> when did the kind of intrigue about storytelling and theater, when did that first emerge for you? <clears throat> Um, well, let's see, uh, you know, I had a circuitous route and, and I, yeah. you know, was not a theater kid like most people in the theater. Um, let's see, I, I kind of came to theater through fiction and uh, I did a lot of outdoor things. I was a guide uh, and I did that kayaking expedition you talked mm -hmm. about and mm -hmm. uh, we had some sponsorship from National Geographic and, you know, we were, we were kids, but we mm -hmm. were um, any, any, thing would help and we you know dreamed of being published and whatnot uh and we kind of ran into the you know the good old boys network the glass ceiling there and you know they said oh, that's kind of interesting your little like, kayaking expedition go back and spend a winter up there with one of those um native tribes and then uh take some pictures and let's talk that was the the most positive one. The others, you know, were just kind of rejection after rejection. And and um, you know, being young and impatient, um, I said, you know, this nonfiction stuff. I'm I'm just going to write fiction. Screw it. So um, being American, I I didn't start with a short story. I started with a novel, of course. Of course. <laughs> and uh, it didn't take me long to realize that. Uh, uh, a writer has a tremendous challenge of creating all these different characters and making them live. Uh, so I started going to the theater just to see how actors uh, inhabited a character. And um, I took a couple classes and, and during that peter, uh, period then I saw a Lecoq company for the first time. And, you know, I'd gone to the Guthrie when I was a kid, we all mm -hmm. got bust down there every year to see plays and you know it just honestly it never did anything for me mm -hmm. but when i saw this uh this lecoq company it, it was uh, a revelation you know it was so immediate and alive and mm -hmm. they were working with different styles uh, so it was uh, there was fantasy in, in it and um you know it was true fiction it was really mm -hmm. uh, stunning and and full of surprise and and, and emotion and all of that. So um, that that was my that was my moment. Yeah, yeah. Did you now, and how long? But when from when you first saw them to when you actually trained there? I mean, was it was it something like that when you saw them? You you had that seed of like, gosh, I would love to 
learn that style of theater or did it kind of come progressively over time? Uh, and it was pretty quick. And yeah. um, they were the uh, two of the founders of the Teatro de la Jeune Lune. And uh, the company hadn't formed yet. Uh, and I knew people who knew them. So uh, I had kind of an entree. Uh -huh. And um, let's see, when they were forming the company then, maybe a year later or something, I said, you know, I, I need to join your company. And um, <laughs> you don't have to pay me, uh, I'll do whatever you want, but I, I need to be in this company. And uh, they kind of said, well, all right, you you write. So, um, you know, we create our, our own plays. So let's just put you on writing down dialogue from improvisation and seeing if you can polish it. Um, you know, so I'd, I'd be at rehearsals and then I'd spend the night basically at the typewriter uh, trying to polish uh, the re the uh, rehearsals and bring it to the next step. And um, I was with them for about two years and mm -hmm. I started with little roles. And uh, by the end of the two years, I was playing pretty large roles, but I had no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, they weren't, uh, they weren't good teachers. I'd learned a lot from through osmosis, but you yeah. know, it was time to, to go to the source myself. So then I went to Lecoq. So, you know, from the time I saw them to the time I went to Lecoq was probably about three or four years. Yeah, yeah. I, I applied one year, but the work was too good with June Loon, so I put it off and yeah. Yeah. And so you kind of your initial foray into that was as a as a writer for that, mm -hmm. you know, that material. When you um when you went to Lecoq to study, um was there an was there something about that training for you that was like did you enjoy the um kind of the acting experience more of that or was, was there an aspect of the training that you were more kind of drawn to than another you know it was it was all about um creating new work uh mm -hmm. through ensemble so yeah. you know everyone was a an actor and a writer and a director yeah. and uh, you know, it depended on any given time period. I, I loved all three of those and I still do. Yeah. How do you, do you find, like for me, it's interesting, like I don't, um, I haven't directed a lot and I, it's something I came to later, but I find in the opportunities that I have to do it, I learn a lot about acting. I've learned a lot about acting, just about, uh, uh, especially that element of where, where does this character fit in the story? You know, like how does this character help tell the story? It was something that I, I, I learned a lot more about in, in directing plays. Are there things for you as a writer and as a director and an actor that, how do those things kind of feed each other for you? Yeah, I, you know, because we're creating plays, um, I don't really know uh, a character's role for quite a while. Yeah. You know, it's much later that that it becomes clear, and then you know we'll we'll say, oh, this character really needs to to push this moment or mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but what what's important, I think, is 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 as a director slash writer, uh, what do we give an actor to to help them? Um, inhabit the character mm -hmm. and it, it's so easy to derail them and and to you know send them in the wrong direction say too much uh say too little uh and each actor is different um but, you know that's quite a journey and it's a very intimate uh kind of experience and and i guess i i focus mostly on that um mm -hmm. yeah I, th I think that's very difficult and and you know I'm still learning that and and enjoying it quite a lot. Yeah, that's interesting because I I've, I've I know one thing I've learned and continue to learn about about directing about those conversations with actors is that usually like less is more. You know, like mm -hmm. for me, it's there's those times when I I feel like we're right in there, and then I'll I'll have one more thing I want to add, and then I'll add I'm like oh you you blew it. Yeah. You know, you, you, it was too much. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's fascinating to learn how, how intricate those yeah. conversations are. And as you said, I mean, how, how unique they are depending on who you're, you know, who you're talking with. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's um, a challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, the first character, the first character that I saw you do was with keyholes was that was Henry, mm. which I just I, I love that character. And I know you you kind of did a brought him back for a kind of a COVID uh, um, story. I wonder if you could just talk about how that character came about. Yeah, uh, it's a dear character. Um, let's see, when we were still based in New York, uh, the first show that we actually built in New Mexico, we were in Las Vegas and uh, someone from New York that we knew, knew someone who knew someone in Las Vegas, New Mexico. And they said, uh, you know, we'll sponsor Grotesco to come out here and build a show, why not? And, and they didn't have much money, but you know, we stayed in people's homes and uh, we rehearsed at the, um, what was it? We were at the sanatorium in Las Vegas. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and we built Fortune, that, that show, Fortune. And when it came close to uh, publicity time, um, we also were kind of doing a lecture uh, performance that had a whole bunch of different styles and things. So anything was fine, anything that would be a good photo. And uh, Ian Rosencrantz was there. He was our, our contact. Uh, we met him on earlier tours and, and mm -hmm. were close with him. So he was a, an important contact for us in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I guess I had those teeth and uh, I'm not sure where the hat came from, but Ian had the camera and suddenly uh, Henry was, was a, a strong image uh, and there was a little bit of a character there, but there was no voice. And, you know, so, you know, he was just in the in the trunk of characters for a couple of years while we built shows and toured. And uh, it was probably two or at least three years later that um, we had a British company member for a while, another Lecoq grad. And um, he was telling a story about uh, touring in England and he'd been, they'd been at this home for, um, you know, people that needed help uh, mentally, mostly. And um, he described this kind of wonderful experience where they did this play and, and all, the, um, all the people came up to them afterwards and, and, you know, he used their voices and he said, nice people nice people and they you know they wanted to shake hands and hug mm -hmm. them and mm -hmm. and uh there was henry's voice um mm -hmm. so so then then uh you know i needed a story and and uh there was a we we got invited to uh, participate in benefits and there was a benefit coming up you know where they wanted short works and i thought okay that's it i'm gonna get henry out and dust him off and and give him a piece and and um Anyway, so uh, that became, you know, if he lived in one of those homes, they'd take him on field trips. That became the bus and he was in the back and, and he had a pocket full of animals. And yeah. basically he told the story of Romeo and Juliet with his animals. Yeah. Uh, so that was Henry. <laughs> Gosh, I just, I love that character because they're so um, funny and poignant at the same time i mean it's just it's 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 funny and heartbreaking all in the same moment which um and for you i don't as it, as it, i mean it must have what's the experience been like for you to have a character that long that you've cut you know and i think you know you kind of come back to it and you, what's it like to kind of be with a character for that for that long one one that's you know so kind of personal to you yeah, it's a great experience. Uh, you know, it's um, I've I've played him enough in enough places that, that I'm very comfortable with him, and and uh, it's really a joy to share him with people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's pretty controversial. Uh, you know, especially these days when when everyone's uh, you know so concerned about uh, making sure we portray people uh with respect and uh you know a lot of times people were saying whoa i was really not sure about that character and and you know how do you how can you do that and uh, you're you know you're not um you're not like those people or, or however they'd say it and and um you know my take is that if if you if if you're doing it with love and yeah. and you're you're sharing uh the humanity of of 
uh, any character, um, that's what the theater's all about, really. And if you can take it right to the edge and, and make people a little uncomfortable and then also make them shift, basically. So they say, oh, shit, I wasn't expecting that. Um, mm -hmm. Wow, I'm touched. Uh, we've done our job, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, yeah, the, I just, I feel like the the humanity of him that you bring is is what's so moving about it, you know? And, um, um, yeah, that, I mean, and it's just, it's it's interesting to hear how, how how he evolved do you just talking about that and and the way henry evolved and and the way you create characters which is from a very kind of physical approach do you like for example for for me different characters will the, the process will be different you know sometimes like if a character has a diet like i love dialects because oftentimes a dialect will just kind of root you in a care and suddenly you just have this this whole world just by the physical act of mm. of creating their voice and you know other times it's you know it's something internal or maybe it's a physical you know you know body choice that you make or a rhythm or whatever do you have with the characters that you create does it depend in terms of how you discover them like some are physical some are internal or do you kind of have a a process that you typically do to navigate finding a character. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, I usually start physically, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, even to to find what kind of costume they wear, especially shoes. What kind mm -hmm. of shoes do they wear? Because that will um, influence how they walk, and that will influence how they move. And uh, so. You know, I, I try to uh, take whatever emotional qualities I can glean from a text or, or from, you know, what we've decided the character is going to be and put that into uh, the physicality of the character. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't always work. And, and then yeah. I'll have to try something else. But um, right. that's usually where I start. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting you mentioned about the shoes because, yeah, I learned such a huge lesson around shoes this was back in we lived in dc and i was doing this um play called bright and bold design which is a, by this northern english writer and i had just seen this and there's a you know working class guy and i had just seen the care and i i just i had boots you know kind of that i wore and that's just kind of what the way and i would wear them to rehearsal and i and then suddenly the um the costume aspect came in and it came in it came in pretty late in the process the costume designer came in and suddenly we had her. and the shoes that she gave me were were just like the soles on the bottom were one they were very hard soles mm -hmm. and they were also just small the shoes were just I mean they weren't tight small but they were just small shoes and it completely like changed the whole feeling I had about and it it, th it really threw me off and I learned a big lesson about you know, all right, I, I want to know what kind of shoe, you know, the, the conversation around shoes is a really important conversation. Oh, it is. And, and you know, it, it can do like you say, it can throw you in, in which case it just takes you completely off your off your groove completely. Or if you get them early enough and find how that character is comfortable in those shoes, you got a character. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, it was interesting because I, I completely, I completely felt kind of off balance, you know, because I just had these grounded, rooted shoes, and it's yeah, it's just it's fascinating because I was like, yeah, the, the shoes quickly became like one of the most, you know, important because yeah, it's, it's kind of your connection to the earth as this person, you know, yeah. like how do you? Did you go back to uh, your shoes? Did you convince them to let you? know, I, unfortunately I couldn't. And I was, I, at that time I was kind of a young actor and I, I, I probably, not, you know, I could have a conversation mm -hmm. now and be like, you know what, I, I was envisioning it this way. Is there anything we can talk about to just kind of, um, you know, but um, no, I just, I just kind of, <laughs> kind of made do and, you know, <laughs> chalked it up to lesson learned, but <laughs> anyway um but i also learned too like and i think that's interesting you know about i learned as well like that thing of like when we do productions i, I remember thinking about like i want to i want to incorporate the costume element 
as early as possible for the actors. Like I want, I want the actors to be able to talk to the costume designer early and know like what they're thinking. And also if they have any ideas of their own that they can just kind of share back and forth and, and doing that like really early on, as opposed to, you know, like a week and a half before you open and oh, here's your, here's your you know. So anyway, that, that was an interesting thing too. Yeah. Um, but, and speaking along that line, just things that I've learned that we've, that we've kind of incorporated into the Ironweed productions. I, the, what we um, kind of the, the working model that we ha have, have had for most all of our time, uh, I learned from you and Grotesco, which was the working, um, you know, working on a piece for months or up mm -hmm. to a year, because that's what we, especially the first kind of 13 years we were uh, a company. I mean, that's what we would do is just do one show a year. And I learned that from, from you and from Grotesco. And I wondered where, where did you learn that at Lecoq? Was that kind of a, a, a model of working there? You, you know, uh, that, that's the way Jun Loon worked. Okay. Um, and I, I think it's probably a uh, standard for, um, European companies that build their own work. It, it just takes that long. And, you know, what I found, what I hear you saying you found was that um, you really get to go deep into the work and it, it pays uh, with the product. And, you know, I, I've always really appreciated the work you do and, and the time you put into it. I mean, for me, it, it just shows so much, uh, you know, it, when you put, three weeks into a rehearsal, uh, no matter how good the team is, it, it's just, you know, it's not, it's not gonna have the same feel. Uh, and, and June Loon actually, um, they, they got a space, they had a beautiful space in Minneapolis. And uh, then they realized that they had to do more work uh, because, you know, they had this space and they had to pay for it and fill it and all that stuff. So they started doing a couple shows a year they had more people than Grotesco has, so they could kind of theoretically work in two teams and, you know, one team would be working on the next show, but acting in the current show. And uh, I ran into them a couple of years after they started that model and uh, they asked, were asking how we worked. And I said, well, you know, pretty much how you guys used to work. And they, mm -hmm. and one of them just said, oh God, I wish we still did that. Um, yeah, you, you, you know, to put all your energy into one project, um, art, art needs that kind of focus. It just does. I, I totally agree. And it's interesting because I, I interviewed Mona Malik uh, uh, earlier in the fall, and she was talking about just that process of taking that amount of time to work on something. And it, just, it was just a great reminder of that. Um, I, I love that amount of time as well and what it allows you to do. And um, it's interesting too, because it made me think a teacher, one of my first teachers at, well, I went to college at James Madison University and Tom Arthur was one of my first, he was actually best friends with Benny Benedetti. So there's been this weird, you know, this <laughs> interesting connection, but Tom, who I still keep in touch with, a dear man and a wonderful uh, teacher and director, he, I had the opportunity at James Madison to be in a production that he directed of Betrayal by Harold Pinter. And he did a unique kind of rehearsal pro. He said that, you know, when he cast it at the beginning of the semester, he said, we're gonna work on the show all semester. So if you're in this production, this is the show that you're doing for that semester. And I was like, I, you know, I was, I was, I was in. And we worked, we rehearsed it just around a table for about six weeks. You know, and really, and, and Pinter, I mean, I love Pinter just because his, you can just try so many different, you know, angles on his, you know, relationships and lines and, but we, so we worked on it for about six weeks around a table and then we came in one day uh, for rehearsal and Tom said, so he said, we're basically, we're, we're starting over. I want you to throw away every, every choice that you've made. I just want, I don't want, yeah, I, I don't, I want you to just completely start from scratch and I want to see something different. I want to just, I don't care how different it is. I just, and it was, for me, it was really, it was incredibly freeing. And it was this huge revelation in terms of, by the time that we put that production up, there was like a path to the end of the play 
-hmm. but we had tried so many different ways and facets that it could take a little different facet here and there and it still got to the same place and it just for me like and as a as a you know early theater person in college I just it felt incredibly alive you know to have that and so it makes me think of what you can do when you when you when you do have that that amount of time yeah that, that, that's a great example you know uh, we work physically uh so much that uh and, and personally, I'm kind of slow at getting it. So I, I need to rehearse each one of those intricate physical bits uh, for a long time before uh, I transcend the, the technicality of it and can make it live. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, we could rehearse less, but those things wouldn't have the same feel to them at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, when you work on a project, because um, it's interesting, I know you said you initially kind of came, uh, uh, writing was kind of your initial foray into theater. And I, when you create a piece with Grotesco, which is incredibly physically based, how, how does language emerge in your process? Uh, well, it depends on the show. Yeah. Especially. Um, you know, generally uh, we'll have scenes that we know are going to be uh, text driven uh, yeah. you know we have to get information across uh, mm -hmm. to drive the story something mm -hmm. like that uh, so um, let's see I, now I'm losing your question how, how does it uh, uh, just are they, like in terms of how you all because I know for you the fit how does the language mm -hmm. how does the language come in or, or what role does that play in your and I know it. I know it changes, you know, from show to show. But in general, how do you approach language with Grotesco? You know, uh, we I think uh, try to realistically uh, describe our our writing as utilitarian. Mm -hmm. So it's really to tell the story. Uh, there's not a lot of poetry, and and um, you know, it's it's not beautifully written material, but uh, we try to get the story across and we try to portray the characters. So, and, and we try to also to, to make it as um, sparse as possible, uh, which leaves time for the physicality. And, and you know, we, we tend to rely on the physicality to uh, deliver uh, the emotional, um, thread that's that's underlying everything so if we can do that in silence um and and with inarticulation as opposed to um as opposed to words we'll we'll do that uh in general yeah yeah, yeah. just to take a little bit of a, a turn from what we've been talking about i'm i'm really curious about your your journey to becoming a state judo champion <laughs> how did that how did that how did that all happen <laughs> <laughs> well uh let's see you know i was kind of a juvenile delinquent and uh, uh you know i think my family was all uh probably in cahoots uh, uh looking, looking out for me and uh my older brother uh was in high school was he in high school already? I don't know. Anyway, uh, some there was a judo club that that had formed and was using the the school, whatever school he was in. I was in fifth grade or something like that. So uh, you know, he came and they um, I fell for it. They all said, "Hey, you know, there's this cool thing that's going on. You could do it if you wanted to." So uh, you know, I said, "Okay," and and uh, I went and and joined this judo club. Uh, this is a long time ago and it yeah. was good. it was great fun because you yeah. know the right away we were um you know diving over people learning how to fall well and um you know I'd, I'd like to be physical so that that stuff was great uh and then I was only I don't know five or six months into it when uh our leader who's a third degree black belt uh, came one night and said uh there's a state tournament and um any one of you guys can can come and do this if you if you like and I thought yeah I'll do that why not and so uh, we all piled into his VW van and drove down to the city and and did the tournament and and um, 
I won. <laughs> it was, I don't know, it was 65 pounds and under or something like that. I mean, I was small and uh, and so were all the guys that I uh, that yeah. I went up against. Uh, but I remember getting home and, you know, it was a different period. Uh, you know, my folks were not soccer parents. Um, you know, they, they weren't there. They were all sleeping when I got home. And here I walked in with this turn with this uh, uh, state uh, champion yeah the, the statue thing and you know everyone was sleeping so I went to sleep too <laughs> <laughs> now did you keep doing judo for uh for a while after that or yeah I did a couple of years and then and then um I was in junior high and I started wrestling um and, and that was kind of fun because I had all these judo moves that um, were not being taught in wrestling uh, <laughs> school. So yeah. uh, I would just use them and, and uh, they were quite effective. Yeah. That's cool. That's, <laughs> well, and it's interesting too, because yeah, and you, you ended up, you know, being drawn to such a physical, um, you know, to physical theater. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just having experience with something that's, I mean, I imagine judo too is hugely about body control and just as precision and mm -hmm. um, and I didn't realize too the thing about learning to fall and and all that, which yeah, uh... <laughs> yeah, and you know I grew up rural, so we were always yeah. swimming and you know right. everything was physical, basically right. sledding and you know all that stuff, skiing and yeah, yeah, yeah it was great. Um, if I had a kid, I'd try to raise him rural. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. <laughs> um, uh, I was curious if I know you uh, with Grotesco. It's it's ensemble work, and it's you know creating a piece from an ensemble, which is a fascinating. I've you know had the experience of uh, of, of working on it with you all a couple of times, and it's just a fascinating one thing to experience and two to see on stage realizing what is all you know uh, what's all gone into it do you ha are there certain published writers or certain is there a published play role that you would love to do oh um gosh um i don't i don't really think about that much um, yeah i'd have to really think about that yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't read plays much, yeah. uh, so it would probably have to be something that uh, I've seen. Right. Uh, you know, when I was younger, of course, I used to think about, um, you know, the big Shakespeare uh, right. roles and, and all that, but, you know, that <laughs> I don't think about that much anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I'd have to really think about that. Yeah. Great question, Scott. What about you? Are there roles that you would love to play? I, you know, one of the things, I mean, I obviously I'm a huge Sam Shepard fan and I, I would love at some point to um, play the older roles in his plays, you know, like the father figure at some, when I'm, when I'm of that age, I would love to, um, yeah. I would love to explore those, um, those characters um yeah you know and that's the first obviously the first play we did was Shepard and there's and I know you know he's a some people love his stuff some people hate his stuff you know it's a but for me like I've just I've never read a playwright where just I'm completely sunk deep into this yeah. world as soon as I just start reading um and there's there's like a razor sharpness mm -hmm. and then this whole like you know, deep soil of, of stuff underneath everything that he writes that I just, anyway, I, I, I think any, any time the opportunity to work on his stuff for me is a, would be a, would be a win. <laughs> yeah, he, you're right. I mean, there's, there's so much that isn't said. It's all about what isn't said with him, which is really exciting because that, that's up to our imaginations then. Uh, we're in, we're part of the process then. And, and that's right. really interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And I, you know, it's interesting, too, because I think of um, he and Pinter, to me, have a lot of similarities in that they're, they can be very sparse with their language. They obviously deal with some serious family, deep family dysfunction. And there's also this quality of um, 
of menace that's underneath a lot of their plays that you it's not in the words it's just this and when you're watching it and it's done well I just feel like there's just this kind of menacing underlayer that you just feel like oh it just something feels doesn't feel good right now you know and yeah I don't know what it is and I don't know what's gonna you know um which I think Pinter has as well yeah you're right and yeah, I, I don't know if you experienced this, but that moment when you're on stage working on one of those plays and and you slip into one of those menacing moments and and you know whether you're it doesn't matter, just you're there and you feel it. It's like oh shit, here we are. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think for me those are to me like I was thinking about this and I was I wanted curious what your what you um your feeling is I was trying to think about like for me like what are the most compelling moments for me on some of the most compelling moments to see on stage and for me I think if I boiled it down to one that I just love it's that moment where you're watching a, a play and you just have no idea what's going to happen in the next moment I mean I just that's just exhilarating and then that you're completely lost in that oh my god I have no idea what's going to happen now um do you have are there for you like watching theater are there certain things that for you are just kind of the most compelling moments that you just love to experience uh, <laughs> it's great to hear you say that because uh, I think my favorite moment is the next moment when something happens that was completely unexpected oh cool <laughs> And, and you basically, yeah. like, oh shit! I didn't see that coming at all. Uh, yeah, wow. uh, that that was amazing. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> cool. Yeah, I yeah, that's great. Yeah, very cool. Um, we've all been. I mean, this has been this. I can't believe we're we're past the year marker, and we've all been living in you know in in COVID and and with this pandemic. Um, I'm just curious for, for, from your perspective, what, what do you see moving through and out of this in terms of live performance? You know, I mean, are there things that you kind of think, well, I wonder if it's going to be more, we're going to see more of this or will this dynamic exist more? Are there things that you either see or, or are curious about how they might evolve when we come out of this pandemic with live performance? Mm, that's a great question. You know, I, I've uh, attended a lot of those Zoom meetings, you know, uh, the national meetings where people are saying we're not going back to uh, the old ways. It's got to be something new. And then you get excited about, well, what does that mean? Um, yeah. You know, we're, Grotesco is really kind of on the edge of American theater. We're, we're outliers in a lot of ways. And so, um, you know, I always, uh, I, I always look for groups that are kind of um, doing something, exploding the way they work or the process they do to create a play or the way they create a play, the way they put on a play, all of that, uh, because I, I look for that moment where it's, it feels really alive. And, uh, it, it, you know, it feels like, um, we've, we've, got, we've fallen into a formula that, uh, that we all use and that the audience knows so well, they don't even articulate it anymore. Um, or they can articulate it, but they feel it. And, you know, they don't come so much uh, and for good reason. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wait for that to, to just blow up and, and to see a new kind of performance that really exhilarates artists and audiences. Um, and will it happen or not? Um, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what about you? Yeah, I. It's hard to say. Like, and I, I guess I've felt since the beginning, and I still feel that just kind of this wanting to see what things look like and feel like coming out of this, and, and just kind of just kind of look at that before kind of going forward with, because I feel like, and I've been thinking about this too, with the, with us kind of navigating through, you know, things have been rapidly changing over the last just even a few weeks. Yeah. And to me, there's an interesting quality. I don't know if this, I can describe this right, but 
because there's not like an end to this that's like a hard fast end it's like people are getting vaccinated some people are vaccinated some people you know there there's just this kind of trickling quality to the end of this that i feel like in some ways it can suddenly we can just be like oh that was over three weeks ago and here we are back and now we're just doing our thing and whatever whereas i i kind of feel like i really want to make sure that i i look at okay now we're kind of coming to the end of this thing and what did i learn or what do i what do i want to keep that i learned from the time or what do i want to maintain that i really value that i discovered and i i, I kind of feel the same way about theater i just kind of want to not necessarily plan what we're going to do when we're out of this, but just kind of wait till we kind of emerge out of it and see what things look like and then kind of what yeah, resonates then. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, in terms of Theater Grotesco, and if folks are watching and don't know of Theater Grotesco or know of Theater Grotesco and want to support um, you all, how can one, how, how can Pete folks support Grotesco and, and what do you all? have kind of in the works and in the in the hopper coming up? Uh, well, let's see, you know, we've um, uh, along the lines of uh, how do we transition into hopefully uh, getting past COVID. Um, and and I say hopefully because, you know, we're not sure how this is going to go. Sure, yeah. uh, but we've decided to screen um, our, our most recent a group of plays uh, this spring. So we're going to be announcing it soon. And I think there's four or five plays that, um, you know, we can look back and say, well, this is our latest phase of Grotesco. You know, we've been around 38 years and we've gone through all these different phases. This is our latest phase. And we want to screen those uh, so they'll be available and, and people can find that on theatergrotesco.org. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not on yet. We're a couple of weeks away from the very first one and we're just kind of mounting all the PR stuff. Um, and hopefully that's a teaser to actually get back to live theater, which would be great. Um, and, you know, if people want to support us, theatergrotesco.org is where they would find more information about us. And, and what's coming up and how to support us, all that cool. stuff. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, and the the film that you're that you've been working on, what, what's that experience been like? <laughs> Boy, it has been such a roller coaster. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, if people don't know Godfrey Reggio, uh, you know, he's an iconic um, filmmaker that that uh, doesn't tell narrative. Uh, works of art whatsoever it's it's visual uh, he works with philip glass uh and and the music is a very important part of it uh this latest film is is he calls it a neoclassical fairy tale and it's for children mm -hmm. and um and he's drawn to the character henry so uh uh henry was there in new york um wow it, it, it you know it it had some just fabulous aspects to it. It was a small group uh, of uh, filmmakers and uh, Godfrey, of course, was there. Um, and they, it was an ensemble in the truest sense. And uh, they were working, everything is being shot on green screen and in miniature. So there's a whole lot of technical work that's happening. And, uh, you know, they don't mind if you look over their shoulder and watch them mm -hmm. at the computer uh, doing all these things. And, and you know, you can ask questions, you can make suggestions, all of that stuff. And, and that was great fun. Um, you know, the uh, uh, film is so complicated, complicated. Mm -hmm. and uh, actors play a much smaller role in the overall project than they do in theater. And, um, you know, there's kind of no way around that in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. I think, I think, you know, in the old days, they used to turn the camera on and let the actors act. And mm -hmm. um, they, they haven't done that in a long time. And now mm -hmm. it's so technical that they want something very specific and it might change, you know, you might work something up and they'll say, no, we're not there uh, today, we want this. And so, you know, you toss that out and try something else. Uh, so uh, it was fascinating and it made me um, really pleased to come back to the theater world and, and, yeah. uh, and you know, get working on some plays again. Cool. 
Oh, cool. Well, uh, speaking of the theater world, I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of um, close off with a last question to you around um, just your, your many years in the theater and your many different experiences. Is there um, an experience for you that you remember that it, whether it was as a performer or as a director watching something you directed, is there, are there, is there a memory that you have where you just felt like this was just, this is why I just love doing what I do. <laughs> Gosh, there's so many, Scott. Um, is there one that kind of just kind of pops to mind? Uh, oh, and you know what, Paul, I worry, I'm gonna, I'm going to pause and give you a second to think about that for one sec because uh, my my cat Calvin is asking to be let out and I'm going to oh, pause the, the video and we'll, we'll be right back. My dog wants in too. Um, so and we're I, back. <laughs> can I give you two because just because sure. I've been around a long time. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, uh, early on in Grotesco's uh, time, uh, Elizabeth and I did a two-person show called The Insomniacs, which was largely silent. and. Um, we were in Hungary, we were playing in Budapest. And uh, we were warming up behind the curtain in a small theater, sat a hundred people or something. And it was, we could hear through the curtain. It was just quiet. There was, some, and we thought we've come all the way here and, and there's no one out there. And um, uh, we, I wander on stage with a candle. Uh, I'm an insomniac. I just woke up in the middle of the night and uh, there were not 100 people in there, there were 150 people in there, uh, like sitting on every step and, you know, plastered against the wall. Yeah. And they were such a, a wonderful audience. Uh, that show uh, was about 60 minutes long. And that night, it was closer to 90, because they, they wouldn't let us leave anything. We <laughs> They just wanted more of that moment before you could go to the next moment. Wow. So that was one. And, and then uh, much, much later, um, we did this show different just before COVID hit, uh, the end of 2019. Yeah. And it was a great experiment for us. Uh, it was a structured improvisation and it was uh, roughly 60 minutes long. And by structure, I mean that the actors had enough of uh, physical and oral a framework that they could actually succeed at doing a 60 minute improvisation, which is an outrageous proposition. Uh, but I watched it every night. And, uh, you know, I, I knew the actors, I knew the characters, I knew the story, they were telling a story. Uh, and that was thrilling. Um, every night, it was thrilling just to see mm -hmm. them get through it and to know when they, they were hesitant, but they'd push through it. Uh, and there was that sense that they all shared that something needs to happen now and I'm going to do it. Uh, and uh, it, it was a real thrill to see that. Wow. Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> well, John, uh, this has just been so uh, inspiring and um, just really rewarding to have the have the conversation with you. I, I really appreciate this this time together. Well, back at you, Scott. Much yeah. appreciated. Thank yeah. you, John, and and thank you all for uh, for joining us. And um, if you would like to see future interviews and you're not part of our email list and would like to join, um, you can email me at ironweedsantafe at gmail.com and I'll put you on our email list and, and let you know uh, what uh, what we have coming up and what projects we have coming up. I'd also like to uh, say a big thanks to Theater Santa Fe. Uh, they're at theatersantafe.org. Wonderful organization. John used to serve on the board with them. Um, they do uh, very supportive of theater in Santa Fe and artists and companies and audiences. Um, and they actually host all of our interviews on their website. So this is our 30, 33rd, I believe, and they've got all of them on there on, the, on an online tab. So many thanks to Theater Santa Fe. Uh, but again, uh, many thanks to you all for joining us. John, thanks again. And good night, everybody. <laughs>